So the question I'd like to pose is, can robot doctors solve our healthcare crisis? And so I know there's at least one physician out there, and so I apologize. You, you have to hear the whole talk to see uh, before you take offense to that statement. But, um, you know, I, I've been a robot fanatic for decades. And uh, I, I just, every film that comes out with a robot on it, I go regardless of whether or not it's good or bad, and I love them all. You know, starting from the Jetsons cartoon and Rosie the Maid, and there's C3PO and R2D2 from uh, Star Wars to uh, Terminator. And my, and my latest hero, you know, if I was to become a superhero, uh, I'd be Iron Man. Uh, <laughs> Now, as Mark just said, the, the, this, is, um, this section of TED is called Imagine If. One of the things I spent a lot of time thinking about is the concept of innovation. And so let me pull you back 30 years. And if you think about banking 30 years ago, you'd, the only time uh, you can access your money and the only place is your local bank, You'd have to be there uh, between 10 and 3, Monday through Friday. Uh, you'd often have to wait in a long line. Uh, you'd get to talk to a nice teller. But um, people 30 years ago imagined if you could eliminate those constraints, if you could access your bank anywhere in the world, if you're on vac vacation in Prague. They'd uh, figure it out. They'd wonder if you could do it 24-7 very efficiently and timely, and as you all know, we have that capability today, and it's very liberating. If you go back 30 years, and let's say you did get a little money, you wanted to invest it in the stock market, you'd call your stockbroker, uh, again, during specific times, you'd trade during uh, you know, date, uh, trading hours, and, uh, and that one individual would really be your main entry point, exit point from the market. So 30 years ago, people were imagining if you could change that as well. You could, you could work on uh, your stock market investments any time, of any time of day from your desk in your pajamas, and you'd be able to track things whenever you, you had time, as opposed to when other people dictated things to you. And you can do that now, and, uh, which has been quite liberating for those of you who spend time on the stock market. Uh, if you go back 20 years and you wanted to research an idea, you'd go down to your local library, you would meet a nice librarian, you'd go and look at the Dewey Decimal System. We haven't said that for a while. <laughs> And you would find out the books and go to the different stories of the, uh, of the library, and you pull out all the information. And people 20 years ago said, boy, imagine if you could just get all the information of the world, world at your fingertips any time of day, 24-7, and we have been able to do that as well. Pretty phenomenal. So as we tra let's transition a little bit more to things I know about a little more. And let's go back 20 years. Heart disease, the number one cause of death. And you, uh, and you said, boy, I, and I know we all have people who know of people who've gone through this, or I'm sure some of you even have in this audience, where you have heart disease. You need it fixed, or otherwise you're going to die. But the fixing process is quite challenging. They cut your chest wide open. They splay your ribs wide apart. They get their hands in there, and they, and they really do some pretty miraculous sewing. And, and, and they're, it's really quite spectacular, but the recovery period is quite traumatic. And uh, very often, you don't even fully recover. And so 20 years ago, people were saying, boy, I'd like to be able to fix the heart but I wish I didn't have to cause my patients so much harm in the process of doing it. And 20 years later, today, by and large, this type of operation on the left is going away through 
uh, little catheters going up through the groin to little incisions in the chest. They can do a tremendous amount of heart repair without the invasiveness of that on the left. And then if you take that concept and you try to generalize it more, you know, 10 years ago, people were saying, boy, you know, the human being is very capable in certain regards, but it's not so capable in, in other regards. My, my hand is the size of my hand. There's not much I can do about it. The tremor that I would have in my hand, and I was faking that, so you don't have to assume I, I'm shaking that much, but the, um, but the tremor is, you know, we all have it. And when you're dealing with one millimeter vessels, it's, it's, it's challenging. So this is where things like robotic surgery came into play. They miniaturize wrists to be five millimeters in size. They eliminate tremor. They place the surgeon into a very ergonomically friendly position. And now, if, for example, you need your prostate taken out because of prostate cancer, usually the approach is doing it through robotics. And, that, and that, th th these examples are all from before to now. So now let's start talking about from now moving forward. I've been a Trekkie for decades. And Bones, I mean quite a physician, uh, from the Starship, trip, uh, Starship Enterprise, could be instantly somewhere else to take care of patients, whatever you know, species or, 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 or race, and instantly be there at the patient's side to take care of him or her or it, and then instantly beam back to the uh, Starship Enterprise. And he would do that through a uh, teleporter, OK? We haven't figured out how to do that yet. Okay, you've got the movie The Fly. You might you might turn into a fly in the process, but that's been uh, that's that's further away. But what if you could take that physician patient interaction and, and 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 replicate that capability with technologies that exist today by uh, enabling the physician to represent themselves as a robotic avatar. And so I'm going to uh, ask my colleague here, Jenny, to come out here. Jenny, if you don't mind. No and worries. Hello, Hewlett. How are you today? Good. And yourself? Good. You have a good looking group of audience out there, don't you? We do. It's quite a group. <laughs> and thank you for spending Sunday with the group here. Great. You know, maybe you can uh, uh, tell me a little bit about this um, capability and illustrate some of its uh, functionality. Sure. So I'm attending Yulin's TED Talk today via remote presence and via this RP7 robot. Basically, the capability of remote presence means that I can be anywhere in the world and beam into a device like this and interact with people such as I am with you and with Yulin. As you can see, I can move the robot around pretty seamlessly, turning it on a dime, back and forth, side to side. This is all controlled by a joystick on my end. And it's, I can move these, the robot just as if I would be standing there moving my head back and forth, talking to each and every one of you. Great. Well, Jenny, maybe uh, you can explain perhaps uh, some of the tools that are available from a diagnostic perspective. Sure. So as Yulin alluded to, these robots are used primarily in the healthcare environment and as robot doctors. Um, the remote doctors have the ability to provide um, consultations and perform diagnostic capabilities through the robot. So I am going to pop a CT scan here up on the face of the robot. I have the ability to telestrate on the CT scan so I can tell the lo local physicians and the patients what I am seeing on this scan. So one of the other capabilities is this robot has a bunch of medical devices on the back of it. Oh, maybe I'll, I'll just take this off here. And sure. You can listen to so my heart. So this is an electronic stethoscope. And this enables me to listen to Yulin's heart and lung sounds remotely. <coughs> Luckily for you all, am I, am I she okay? has quite a heart, strong heartbeat right now. <laughs> it, 
And Jenny, maybe you could explain how someone might use this in a clinical type setting. Sure. So um, I, I'm here remotely with you guys, and doctors can be remotely into a hospital. So let's take a Lompoc ER case. Imagine if a patient were to present in the ER with stroke type symptoms, such as slurred speech, blurry vision, drooping face. And the, remote, the emergency room physician is fairly confident that it's a stroke, but because of treatment options, they want to get a second expert opinion, such as a neurologist. So they can call down to the Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital, talk to some neurologists there. Those neurologists can actually beam into this device, which we have up at Lompoc, and provide remote consultation, kind of similar to the, the, the things that you and I just provided right now. Great. Well, thanks, Jenny. So I'm going to no just continue here. And, uh, um, and so first of all, for the title, the, uh, you can hang out with me if you want. All right. But with the, uh, with the um, title, Can a Robot Doctor you know, Solve the Healthcare Crisis? The, what we're obviously doing here is a physician extender as opposed to an autonomous robot doctor, which I think is a long, long, long ways off of ever because there's a tremendous amount of knowledge there. So now well, let's go to the second part of the talk, which is solve the healthcare crisis. And indeed, we do have a crisis uh, at hand. And I'd like to first talk about a positive side of healthcare and what's happened. If you look at this graph, you can see um, how life expectancy has changed over the last many thousands of years. Starting from the Bronze Age, which was several thousand BC, all the way through the early 20th century, pretty much everyone in this room would be dead if, uh, uh, if they just lived the, life, the normal life expectancy. Then starting really the early 19th, uh, 20th century, 1900, late 1800s, you start seeing this hockey stick. Life expectancy is going up like crazy. Why is that? Is because medical science is being brought to bear and it's doing wonderful things. We've heard some talks earlier today about, say, nanoparticles and how that's going to keep going. What's really happening is that life expectancy is going up one year for every four to five calendar years. And that trend is, is continuing. So that's great for us as individuals, but it creates some problems here uh, for us in terms of the entire healthcare system. On the left side, what you have is the demographics of the population, and on the right side is you have the corresponding change of, of, of healthcare consumption. So on the left side, it went through a little animation here. I'll go back through them again. And you can see how as I advanced from 1980, 2000, 2010, 2020, we went from a pyramid structure to a stovepipe. And on the right side, which is the consumption of healthcare, it really went from a stovepipe to an inverted pyramid. Why is that? Is because older people require more healthcare resources. So the good news is that we're living longer, we're able to live happier, long lives, and the bad, but the bad news is that the com consumption of healthcare has, has gone up dramatically, and it's so bad that today, uh, for the US, we're consuming about 16% of our GDP on healthcare. That's continuing to rise. The upper right graph is the expenses. The United States spends more in healthcare than the next six countries combined. On the lower left-hand graph, we, sh we spend more per capita than twice the next country. And then the lower right-hand graph is a graph created by the Congressional Budget Office, which shows that if we don't bend the curve or change things, by the end of this millennium, 50% of the gross domestic product will be spent on health care. That, you know, it's not just a health care problem, it's a societal problem because the society would go bankrupt during that whole process. Finally, the uh, physicians are aging as well, like the rest of society. If you look at the upper graph, the blue lines are the distribution of physicians in 1985, and the red bars are the distribution of physicians in 2005. So we have a lot of retiring physicians. And then the lower 
the graph shows the number of enrollees into medical school per 100,000 people, and that's going down. So these are the trends that are going on. And so we know earlier this year, there was a massive health care reform bill passed. And regardless of what you think about it, in terms of the specifics of it, I think that uh, most people who are knowledgeable in this area, pretty much everybody, appreciates the fact that health care reform does have to happen because of the, uh, the, the constraints and the, and the trends that I just went over. So there's a bunch of concepts being thrown out in terms of pay for performance, bundling, transparency, et cetera, and we don't need to get into that jargon. But the point is, is what we have to do is innovate our way out of this process, uh, out of this problem. And, and I guess one of the innovations I was just wanting to share with you today was this innovation around something like a robotic doctor. This would fall under the umbrella of what might typically be called telemedicine or telehealth. And telemedicine and telehealth, one of the things that, that I focus a lot on is that the future of healthcare delivery in itself has to become incorporated with telemedicine as, as one of the key solutions to the healthcare crisis we have. So, in ending, I guess, you know, getting back to the original question, can a robot doctor solve our healthcare crisis? Hopefully, I've added some insights to possibilities which might be possible. Thank you. Yeah.